How's it going guys? I'm Robert from Machado Visuals and I want to give you some insight on testing your camera's latitude. A latitude test is simply seeing how a camera responds to various degrees of over and under exposure. This is a test that was brought down from the good old film days when you would test a particular film stock and see how it responds to different exposure indexes, also known as emulsion testing. If you're familiar with the FS7 in Cine EI mode, it's a similar concept. A lower exposure index allocates more dynamic range to the shadows, while a higher exposure index will give you increased highlights. This is why cameras like the Alexa are so sought after because they have an incredible amount of latitude. If you've ever tried adjusting your exposure in post and find that it looks like a nuclear bomb just went off with the tiniest of adjustments, it's probably because your camera doesn't have a ton of latitude to work with. A latitude test doesn't necessarily equate to dynamic range, but rather the amount you're able to push and pull the image in post. This information is extremely important so that when detail is at one end of the spectrum, you know to what extent you'll be able to extract in post if needed. Camera manufacturers generally state how much their camera's dynamic range has, and a latitude test is a good way of determining how much usable dynamic range you have. This is why I always try staying at my native ISO whenever possible so that I maximize dynamic range and latitude. I know that's not always feasible in run and gun situations, but it is generally a good practice to stick with your base ISO. Now there are a couple things you'll need before we get into testing a camera's latitude. First off, you'll need some sort of color chart and a gray card. Every gamma curve exposes middle gray differently, so having a gray card that's calibrated to 18% middle gray is important so that we can establish what the camera manufacturer deems as proper exposure. Also note that 18% middle gray is a very specific shade of gray, so you can't just use any gray card you have laying around. The reason we want to use a color checker is to observe how a camera responds to drastic changes in exposure. This brings us to our second thing you'll need, a monitor that can display a waveform. This is so that we can place middle gray at your base exposure. Every gamma curve has a specific IRE level used to expose middle gray and every camera is different, so it's important to know this value. However, some people disregard this number when testing latitude to take skin tones into consideration. For example, when testing the Pocket 6K, a properly exposed middle gray underexposes skin tones by about a stop. To find where you should be exposing middle gray, look online for your gamma curves white paper. The next thing you'll need is a model. This is pretty self-explanatory. This is just to see how skin reacts to changes in exposure and where the latitude starts to fall apart. In an ideal world, you'll have two models with both fair and dark skin tones, but in most cases, one is fine. The next thing you'll need to consider is what's actually shown in your frame. You'll notice that on my color checker, I've labeled each shade of gray N plus a specific number. I spot metered each of these values and have determined that those tones are two stops above normal exposure, normal exposure, one and a half under normal, and three and a half under normal. This is so that as we go through each series, we're able to see at what point the image starts to fall apart. More on that later. This brings me to the last thing you'll need, a light meter. Now, this isn't necessarily essential, but I do recommend having one so you can calibrate your camera's perception of middle gray to your meter. All meters are calibrated to a specific shade of middle gray, but gamma curves are all different, and it's important to have the camera and meter on the same wavelength. Before we actually start the test, we need to establish a few ground rules. First, make sure you conduct your test at your native ISO. As I mentioned before, this will allocate the maximum amount of highlight and shadow detail. Next, make sure you're shooting in a log format to ensure you're capturing the highest dynamic range possible. Also, make sure you're shooting with the least amount of compression or the highest quality codec possible. And finally, try using lenses with T-stops if you can. T-stops account for light transmission through the lens so your exposure is calculated and accurate. Using a lens with regular F-stops wouldn't be the end of the world, but you might have slight discrepancies when adjusting exposure. For more information on the differences between f-stops and t-stops, check out this great video from Mac Ranger. Now that we have everything we need, let's dive into methodology. We'll begin by recording our overexposure test. Start with your base exposure as determined by middle gray. S-Log3 puts middle gray at about 41 IRE, so I'll use a waveform to put 80% gray at the proper IRE. Keep in mind the inverse square law when lighting these. The farther away your light is, the flatter it will be, which is what you want. My key was fairly close, which is why middle gray has a slight skew in the waveform. Start at a smaller T-stop and open your iris to raise exposure. Once you've shot your base exposure, open up by half stops to record the next sequences. I changed my full stops in the interest of time and repeat this until you're about five or six stops overexposed. Then do the opposite for your underexposure test. Adjust your lighting to start at a wider T-stop and close down for each sequence. Also be sure you slate your settings and sequence numbers so that you know what you're looking at in post. 
Speaking of posts, let's talk about workflow. You can of course use any NLE of your choice, but I'll be going through my workflow in DaVinci Resolve. I've actually jumped ship completely to Resolve and it's done wonders. I recommend it for the sole fact that I can get through an entire project without a single crash. I'm looking at you Adobe. Not to mention, it's free. First, create a timeline with all your clips in two layers, your base exposure on the first layer, and your over-under sequence on the second layer. I'll then flag my clips in the first layer and adjust the scaling and position so that both layers are on top of one another. This might seem a bit strange, but you'll see why in a sec. Once that's done, head to the color page and use the lift gamma gain wheels to adjust your exposure on the over and underexposed clips until it matches your base exposure. Since we stacked our clips earlier, it's much easier lining up the waveforms by lining up each shade of gray on the gray card. This is pretty tedious if you don't have some sort of control panel, but I'm using the micro panel which makes adjusting exposure a million times easier. Once this is done for each sequence, we can finally start evaluating the image. As the exposure starts changing, we can see exactly where the image starts to fall apart and also where color starts to degrade at different levels of exposure. Emulsion tests were originally intended for testing different exposure ratings for film stocks, but now they're even more relevant in comparing base ISO sensitivities. Now that camera manufacturers are starting to implement dual base ISOs in their cameras, it's important to understand how these different sensitivities affect dynamic range. For instance, when examining the FX9 dual base ISOs, I can see that the high base ISO 4000 loses about a half a stop of highlights, but has a nearly identical noise pattern to the low base ISO of 800. These, among many, are important factors to consider when choosing what settings to use for your project, which is why it's important to test latitude. Manufacturers will often state how much dynamic range their camera has, but you'll just be going off their word unless you test it for yourself. Hopefully this video is helpful in some way. I know a lot of YouTubers include latitude tests in their camera reviews, but I feel like a lot of people don't know what they're looking at, so hopefully this demystifies some of the methodology. I encourage you to try this for yourself and see how your cameras react to extreme changes in exposure. If you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments below. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.